Welcome, welcome to Worship from Schweitzer. I'm Pastor Jason. So glad you've joined us in worship today. If this is your first time, we'd love for you to take a moment. Let us know that you're here. We'd love to send you a, a thank you for being with us today in worship. Today is week six of a sermon series that we've been in, Why the World is the Way That It Is. And we're gonna be hearing from Pastor Spencer in just a moment. If you'd like to go deeper with the things that you hear today, or with all of our sermons, or a lot of different ways that you can connect at Schweitzer, we encourage you to go to schweitzer.church slash next. You'll find a lot of ways to be involved and where you can grow deeper in your faith. We're really glad you're here today. Up next, we're gonna hear about things that are happening this week that we can be a part of. So let's turn our attention to what's coming up. Hello, welcome to Schweitzer. I'm Stephanie. Next Sunday night, February 19th, from 6 to 8 p.m., we'll be hosting a seminar entitled Christ and Culture. Tracy McKenzie, a professor from Wheaton College, will lead our time together as we dive into what it means to love God and live in our world today. You won't want to miss this engaging conversation. We are getting closer and closer to Easter on April 9th. And as we prepare our hearts for this time, we will be hosting an Ash Wednesday service on February 22nd at 6 p.m. We hope you'll join us. Along with all of this, we have two new classes beginning during Lent. Poverty Cure will be led by Pastor Jason beginning Ash Wednesday after the service, and we'll be taking a look at Schweitzer's approach to meeting our community's needs. Corey will begin leading a book study on February 27th, that's a Monday evening at 6.30, about the Sabbath and finding balance between work and rest. You can find out about all of our groups at schweitzer.church groups. Saturday, February 25th at 10 a.m., we're excited to host our first Schweitzer Writers Roundtable. If you are a writer or an aspiring writer, join us to learn about publishing, getting that creative spark going, and more. You can sign up online at schweitzer.church next or get more information at the Blue Booth today. We know there's a lot going on at Schweitzer, and if you're new or just want to learn more about our church, we invite you to attend our next All In Lunch on February 26th. You can sign up online at schweitzer.church next, or as always, you can get more information at the Blue Booth in the lobby. We are so grateful that you're with us this morning. Let's continue with worship. Now, if you're worshiping with us live, we'd encourage you to take a moment to wave to those who are in the chat room, say hello to friends. If you need prayer, there's somebody that would be happy to pray with you. Now let's come into worship with our heads lifted high for the Lord longs to welcome us into His space and to speak His words of life into us. So let's worship together with joy.
last few weeks in our time of prayer time, we've been using a prayer confession because we find that there's something that's not right within ourselves and this thing that's not right within ourselves continues to live with us and that's the reality of sin. So today as we come to a time of prayer, I want to invite you once again to pray with me a prayer of confession. And then we'll have a time of silent prayer where we remember how God is good to us and then we'll come out of that with saying the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we confess that in our humanity we have sinned against you by our actions and thoughts, and we have sinned by failing to do the things that you have required of us. At times our lives have reflected only our selfish desires and motives through hurtful and harmful words spoken against others created in your image and through actions that do not honor you. Apart from your grace, we are incapable of living into the fullness of who you have created us to be. This awareness brings with it the burden of shame and guilt. In our humility, we are grateful for the blood of Jesus Christ, which redeems and covers all shame and guilt, and for the Holy Spirit who empowers us to forgive like you, to love like you, and to see others the way that you see them. We are thankful that because of the cleansing power of the cross, we can lay all our guilt and shame at the feet of our Savior. In the powerful and redeeming name of Jesus, amen. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear the things that are burdening us down this week. And hear the things where we're really, we're thankful because we've been reminded this past week of how you draw close to us. And you are always doing a new work in and through us. Thank you for hearing our prayer of confession. And teach us to pray as we pray with Jesus, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So on campus this week, we're uh, celebrating the Schweitzer and now Flourish Food Pantry. 20 years ago, there were some folks, Ed Hewlett was one, and he, he drew some other folks around him who saw a need that was taking place in our community. And he invited others and he led a charge for Schweitzer to begin a food pantry. And that became the genesis of what is now Flourish and the pantry present there. Um, today we're celebrating that. And all the lives that it's touching, presently touching, and how God's healing is being brought to bear in our community both through those who serve and those who find this as a, as a place of relief in their daily life. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for following a sense of vision and mission from a small, from a small a cupboard into now a full-formed pantry. God has done some amazing things. And it's part, in part because people like you have been faithful with your tithes, your offerings. You can give today at Schweitzer.church slash give or through the Church Center app. Thank you so much. But now, let's hear from Pastor Spencer in week six of Why the World Is the Way That It Is. How could I say there is no God when all around creation Well, friends, welcome today. I'm so glad that you're here with us. My name is Spencer, and today we're continuing our series called Why is the World the Way That It Is? We're looking at the first few chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11, that give so much foundation and understanding for, for why the world is the way that it is. So we're starting our year 
looking back, looking back at the very beginning of the Bible and what it says about our creation. I mean, as we do this, as I think about these first few chapters, I think about it as like putting on glasses where where this fuzzy, confusing, blurry world becomes clear. That's what these chapters help us do. They help us see the world and why it's like it is, the way it is, uh, with, with so much more clarity. Uh, today, we're going to cover a ton of ground. We're going we're gonna to look at the story of Noah and the flood. It's Genesis chapter 6 through 9. It's the longest uh, section that's within these, this first section of the Bible, this first section of Genesis. Um, and as we do this, this is a story that a lot of times is thought of as like a kid's story. It's, uh, you know, in children's Bibles or on the murals of, of Sunday school classes and kids' rooms. And, and it's probably one of these things that we haven't thought much about as adults because we think of this as a children's story. In fact, maybe you haven't thought about this story much at all as an adult, but, but I'm, there's so much here, so much here that, that teaches us about why the world is the way that it is. So we're going to move past thinking about this as a kid's story, and dig down into this and, and really um, see how this story sheds some light on why the world the way, is the way that it is and, and how we can make sense of some of our own struggles. Um, so to do, get going here, uh, we need to start with uh, remembering where we've been because to understand Noah and the flood, we really need to understand it in context to the whole story that's being told and what we've covered so far. So we think about how the Bible opens. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Very, very important. Read this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then pay attention to verse 2. It says, now the earth was, listen to these words, formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Listen to those words. Uh, formless, empty darkness, deep, and there's waters. As you read through Genesis 1, the story of creation and how God made all these things in these six days, what you find is that God is, is creating um, order out of disorder or out of chaos would be another word that you can use. And you, you can see this as, as, as we see here because what is more chaotic or what is more disordered than formless, empty, dark water? So God creates out of this. And then in Genesis chapter 2, we read about this, uh, this garden that humans were placed in where life is happening as God intends it to happen. And the marriage relationship is given and Adam and Eve are tending to, to, the, uh, to the animals and the, and the creation and the, and the garden that's given to them. This is a, this picture even of what heaven is going to be like as we see life in the Garden of Eden. But by chapter 3, things take a turn south and Temptation is introduced, the snake shows up and starts to whisper its lies, and the man and the woman, they find themselves uh, listening to this temptation and, and, and embracing this rebellion within them that, that leads them astray. And as you read the closing of, of Genesis chapter 3, you just you see this door open to all of these problems that we see in the world today. So much that by the time you get to Genesis chapter 4, the very next chapter, you just turn the page, now you see the consequence of, of the rebellion that has come upon the earth of, of these, from these first uh, two people. And, and, it, and it's manifested in their children. And so the, the sin has been passed this next generation and their children, their sons, Cain and Abel, um, out of jealousy, Cain kills Abel. And the Bible tells us that Abel's blood cries out for justice to God. And, and you see this first death at the hands of, of violence and jealousy. And, and really as you read through these first few chapters of the Bible, you get this sense that this good world that God has created is just unraveling. And this leads us to Genesis chapter 6. The story of the flood begins in verse 5, and here's how it goes. It says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And then listen to this next line, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. I'm gonna read that one line again, that the inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was, listen to this, grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind from whom I have created from the face of the earth men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. You might be tempted to think about the flood as this angry God who is, who is, who is so angry that he is, he's wiping out the earth uh, uh, by, just because he's so angry. But as you read the Bible here, what you really see is that God is not angry. 
God is uh, grieved. He, he is sad. This is how God views sin, is that it grieves him on a deep level. Verse 8 says, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Bible's going to go on and describe how, how the Lord calls to Noah and tells him to build the ark, how he gathers his family together, gives these detailed instructions about how to build this, this boat and uh, gathers his family. The ark is built, his family and him board the, the ark. The animals come two by two. You've seen the pictures, you know how it goes, you know the story. And everyone's tucked in safe and sound. And then we come to Genesis 7, verse 11. And this is what we read. It says, on that day, when everyone's tucked into the ark, safe and sound, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. And the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, rain may not sound all that remarkable. It rains all the time, but this is the first time in the Bible that we read about rain. And as we, as we read this, we need to remember Genesis chapter one, where we read as we started to this. Let's think about this in context to the whole story here. And as we read Genesis chapter one, we remember that when God creates, he creates um, the earth out of the empty, formless, dark water. Right? That's what, that's what God does. But here you have God doing the exact opposite. That instead of creating order out of the chaotic waters, instead God is going to use the waters to create chaos out of the order. He's reversing what it is that he's done. This is, this is backwards here. Now the, the ancient Hebrews, they believed that the earth... Um, existed, their kind of cosmology, how they existed, thought about the universe was they thought that the, the earth existed in between two great waters. There was a water above and then there was a water below. And so if you go read Genesis chapter one, days two and three in particular, God talks about separating the waters above from the waters below. He talks about separating the dry ground from the waters. And this is how, you know, the ancient uh, Hebrews understood this and, and that, that there was a great water that was above us and there was this great water that was uh, below us. And of course, you know, we hear that and we might scoff at that idea. Like it sounds, it sounds silly. I mean, you think to yourself, didn't they know about you know, rain and precipitation and evaporation, how that cycle of water works. Well, of course they didn't. That's not at all how they thought of the earth. But, but if you think about that cosmology of the great water above and the great water below, it makes sense. I mean, because sometimes the sky is open and rain falls. And if you don't know about evaporation and precipitation, like where does that water come from? Or other times, if you dig deep enough, you come to uh, wells or springs that are under the earth and you think to yourself, where's that water come from? And so they, they thought that there was a water above and this water below. And, and as you read through Genesis chapter seven, you know, God is talking about opening the floodgates of both the water above and the water below. This is what's happening here with, with the flood. And so as you, as you read this in context to Genesis chapter one, the picture is like, crystal clear of what the Bible is describing with this flood. This is not just a rainstorm. This is, this is not just a, you know, a heavy rain that got out of control, but really as you read this, what God is doing here is, is he is, he is allowing his creation to turn back into uncreation. This is what's taking place with the water above and the water below, the floodgates opening and, and the waters again filling the earth. And, and he's allowing this, 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 what is, you know, this ordered world to, to turn back into chaos. And so it's not that, you know, God is flooding the earth to punish the bad people, but rather what he's doing is he is, he is reversing the creation of what he's done. This is the picture we get. So keep reading here. This is verse 17. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains and under the, and under the, uh, the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for about 150 days. Chapter eight, verse one. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And again, let's remember this in context. Here's Noah. They're floating in this ark above these chaotic waters. 
And as you read about Noah here, he's, he's got the wild animals and the livestock that's with him. And you could picture all these animals two by two that are, that are here and then. And, and Noah, what is he doing? He's tending to them. He's taking care of them. These, these animals that have come to find refuge in the ark above the chaos of the waters and the floods. And you have to kind of think to yourself, um, you know, as Noah's tending to this, does this, does this sound familiar to anything else that we've read in this series? Well, it should. Because the picture is really, really clear here is that this sounds like Eden. As you think about this ark that's floating on the earth with the, the, the crowded, the, the flooded earth with the, these, these animals and, and Noah's tending to them. I mean, this is, this is a picture. This is a symbol of Eden. Very, very clearly, the ark is meant to symbolize Eden. And so you can imagine this boat that's floating above the waters. You've got these animals. You've got, I'm sure, predator and prey all aboard and Noah is doing what his ancestor Adam did, intending to them and taking care of them and, and fostering this life that's, that's here on this boat as it floats above, above the chaos of the waters. This is the Garden of Eden restored in this, in this ark. It's a really beautiful picture as you start to piece together what's happening here because while the destruction of the floodwaters reigns and chaos reigns, there is this little Eden that is floating on the waters. And it's this reminder that God does not give up on his creation. Even in the midst of chaos and while God allows the consequences of our rebellion to bear full fruit, God never gives up on his creation. He never turns his back on us. Now we keep reading here. It says, God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark as he's tending to them. And then the next line says, and he sent a wind over the earth. And the waters receded. In Hebrew, the word wind is ruach, which is also the word for spirit. Uh, We think about Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And once again, the the wind, the Spirit comes and recedes on this on this waters. And the same thing's happening again. And once again, the Spirit is showing up to, to blow over the earth, and the waters of chaos recede. And Noah has found favor with God and has been doing and tending to these, to these uh to these animals, to this garden that's been floating on the waters, and he's been living into the vocation that his ancestor Adam abandoned through his rebellion. And as Noah's doing this, we come to the end of verse 2, chapter 8, verse 2, and it all comes to the end in the opposite way that it started. So you compare how it starts to how it ends. Here's how it ends. It says, Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens have been closed, and the rain stopped falling from the sky. And so Noah uh, waits for the waters to totally recede and he sends in birds out to search for dry ground. You know the story, the, eventually the dove returns with the olive branch in its beak. And as Noah opens the door of the ark, you know, this new Eden is now supposed to spread out into the world. And so we read this, this is 8.15. So God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and their wives, And bring out every living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. This is very, very similar language to Genesis chapter 1 when God speaks to humans who he's made in in his image and likeness. He tells us the same kind of stuff. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, take care of it, tend to it. This is the same kind of language he uses again. Verse 18, so Noah came out together with his sons and his wives and his sons' wives and all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground, and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though Every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So now we can begin again. We've started again, all the filth has been washed away by the floodwaters, the chaos ensued, and now God has brought order back into this earth. And now you have a true man, and a new Adam, who, is, who has been given, who has got his wife and these animals. And, and you, when you read the, the story of Noah in children's Bibles, this is where the story ends. And, and, uh, but this isn't the end of the story. 
for some reason, that's where the children's story is in, but this isn't the end of the story. But, but the next part of the story, so, so, so important, but when you read children's Bibles, this next part of the story is always omitted from the story of Noah and the flood. And uh, this next part is so, so important because without it, the story of the flood, I don't think, makes any sense. That you have to have this next part, how the story concludes, even though children's Bibles don't do this, and probably if you learn the story in Sunday school as a kid, this next part wasn't told to you. But again, I don't think the story of Noah makes any sense without this last part of the story. And so as we, as we do this, um, we're going to drill down into this, and, and as we read this last part of the story, the conclusion to Noah and the flood, we begin to see some answers to some of the questions about why is the world the way that it is. And so um, if the story of end, Noah ended here with what we've read so far, what we have pictured is that this, this, this undoing and redoing of creation of the waters and this new Adam and his family and this Eden that's been placed on the earth, you're, you're left to think that it worked. Like, oh my goodness, the filth and the rebellion was washed away and, and now there's this new start, this new Adam and this new, new life that's happened. But, but the truth is the inclination of the human heart is, is evil. So how does the story end? Well, let's go to chapter 9. Verse 20, and here's how the story ends. It's kind of disturbing. It says, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. So far, so good. This, this is great. Uh, this is what Adam did. He tended to gardens, and Noah, as the new Adam, he's also tending to this garden. He's doing the same thing. Here's this hope that we have that, you know, life is going to be restored to how it's supposed to be. Creation has been saved. Like, we're rejoicing here. And in the Bible, vineyards and, and wine are oftentimes a symbol of blessing. But you know what? When your heart is turned towards rebellion and is inclined towards evil, blessings can be abused and become selfish. And so here's the next verse, verse 21. When he, Noah, drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Now, this is uh, what you call an understatement. I mean, Noah didn't just drink some wine. That's not the problem here. I mean, look at this. He didn't just drink some wine. He, he's passed out drunk. And, and the phrases here have, have a lot that's buried in them that we miss because we're so, so far removed from the culture this was written in. But, but these, these words here kind of imply more than just an alcohol problem that Noah has developed from maybe being trapped in the ark for all those months. But in short, as, as, you, as you read here, this to lay uncovered is a very shameful thing in, in the culture that this would have, would have arisen from. And, and it's a, it's, there's an implication here that there was a shameful act that took place. And if you go forward in the story and read a little bit further, we're not going to do this. This family-friendly environment, so we're not going to read all the things that happen after this. But if you, if you keep reading in the story, one of Noah's sons um, ends up being condemned. And, and the way that it's talked about and explained here is there's a lot of thought that something very shameful, it's not spelled out, but something very shameful has taken place in Noah's family, probably between Noah's son and Noah's wife. It's a very shameful thing. And in short, what we see here is that Noah and his family's actions um, are going to start the story all over again. The unraveling of the world is going to begin again. The story of kind of spinning out of control is going to happen again. And so for some reason, I don't know why, but, you know, children's Bibles never include this last part, but it's so really, really, really important. So it gets me about Noah and the flood. Um, it's not so much the flood, however interesting that is. I mean, it's fascinating. But what really gets me is at the end of the story, Noah, who, you know, is set up to be the new Adam, is that once again, he fails, just like Adam failed. And that's what really grabs my attention here, because it's like, it's like Noah can't escape what's deeply inside of him. He can't, he can't escape, uh, the inclinations that are within him. And there's, there's something about that, that that explains to us, you know, why the world is the way that it is and, and, and the struggles that we have because we see that same kind of pattern every single day. Um, I think about it like this. I have dogs and our dogs have access to the backyard and the front, do- front yard. And, and for whatever reason, I, I couldn't tell you why, but but uh, my dogs have this tendency to just walk around our house. I don't know why they do this, but they, but they do this. And I've noticed that after a little while living in this house, that the grass in, uh, around my house was, was laid down. 
And then a little while later, I started to notice that it wasn't just that the grass was laid down in the yard where they walk around the house over and over and over again, but they actually depressed the earth. And so there was this groove, this rut that had formed in my yard a couple inches deep. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't have big dogs. I mean, my, my biggest dog is 40 pounds and, and like, you know, it's not a horse, it's just a 40 pound dog. And I'm thinking to myself, how many laps does a 40 pound dog have to do around your house before it's actually depressing the earth so that you have a, a, a path that is uh, grooved into your earth. You have this, this rut that's formed in, in, in life. And as I think about my dogs walking around my house over and over and over again and having this rut that's formed, like I can't think about how this is exactly how some, or let me say that a bit more accurately, how all of us tend to live. Like all of us have these ways where we have these repeated patterns of dysfunction, selfishness, or destruction that we all choose. And we just walk in these patterns over and over and over again. And before long, what you find is that you, you live in your life in this kind of, this kind of rut that forms where, where those patterns of life just become normal. And, and you, you have a hard time seeing life outside of those patterns because you just stay in them over and over and over and over again. Like we find ourselves in these repeated patterns of destruction and after a while, those patterns are just, they're just all you know. It's like, it's like if you live with anxiety long enough, if you live with anger long enough, if you live with unforgiveness long enough, if you live with a bad marriage long enough, if you live with misplaced priorities long enough, if you live with an addiction long enough, pretty soon it's all you know. And this becomes the, the default to your life. And so you live yourself, you find yourself living in these, in these same patterns of life, the same patterns of dysfunction, of destruction, of selfishness, of addiction. And you just live in these, in these ruts day after day, year after year, decade after decade, because it's all you know. This last weekend, my family, we went out to dinner went to this restaurant. We don't go out to dinner all the time, but we went to this restaurant and we found uh, at this restaurant that we really like that it was one of those nights where it was overcrowded and understaffed. Common, common, pl common way to live these days. And so it was overstaffed, it was understaffed and over, overcrowded. We sat at our table and we weren't getting served. We weren't getting served. I'm not going to lie. I was starting to get a little grumpy, a little, you know, my blood sugar was starting to drop a little bit. And my, my, my grumpiness was starting to manifest, not just in my head, but it was starting to, you know, come out my mouth. And I was starting to, to grumble a little bit about how the service was so bad. We weren't getting served. We should just leave. And my, one of my daughters, um, she stopped me and she said, dad, you should stop complaining. I was like, ah, I'm supposed to say that to you. You're not supposed to say that to me. And she, she said to me, but I was like, oh, I was also thinking, yeah, you're right. Because here's this, this time I have with my family. I don't get this all the time. And instead of being grateful for this time we're around the table, our phones are away. We're just talking with one another. We've had a good day together. Instead, I find myself grumbling and complaining because I've turned the evening to, to, to be about me. Like It's a pattern. It's a rut you find yourself in before you even know it. It's just, it's just sometimes you default into these actions, these patterns that, that are destructive, they're selfish, they're dysfunctional, and you, you end up finding yourself making it about me. This is the story of Noah. It's the story of ruts. It's the story of dysfunction. It's the story of patterns of living where you can't get past, uh, you know, the, the life that you wanted to live into because, I mean, you think about Noah. Noah is the new Adam. He's presented as the bringer of the new Eden. He's the tender of the garden. And, and as Genesis told us, Genesis told us though, the inclinations of his heart are still evil. There's a rut that's formed. And I know it's hard to hear, but this is what Genesis teaches us about the human condition is that we find ourselves living in these patterns of dysfunction and destruction and ruts because the human heart is inclined towards self. The human heart is inclined towards destruction. This is, this is what it is to, to be human. And I, and I know that's hard to hear because we like to think, well, that's not true for me. My heart's not bad. My heart's good. My heart wants good things. But the truth is all of us have these kind of ruts that we find ourselves living in. And it's, it's the story of Noah. Now, the Bible could have easily ended in Genesis chapter 9. The Bible could have ended there and it would have been a true story. It's the story of a man who is positioned to be the new Adam 
and yet falls again because turns out his heart is inclined towards evil. His heart is inclined towards self. This is the human story. We all find ourselves in these, in these stories. It's a, it would have been a hopeless story if Genesis was the end of, end of the Bible, but thankfully that's not the end of the Bible because God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't give up on any of us. And the, the reason why God promises to never send another flood in the story of Noah and the flood is because instead what God is going to do is he's going to deal with the root problem of our lives, which is our heart. So God promises to never send another flood because instead God is going to send his own son. His son that's, that's given for us, his son is going to take our addictions and our dysfunctions and our destructions and our selfishness and our ruts that we find ourselves in. He's going to take that upon himself. He's going to be sacrificed for us. and He's going to defeat those things through the power of his resurrection. As we turn to the New Testament, I, I think it's no wonder that when the Bible describes what this new life in Christ is like, it, it describes it in this profound way that, that, that brings us back to Genesis. Listen to how the Bible describes the new life in Christ that we have. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Now, if we hold on for just a second, we got to think to ourselves, wasn't, wasn't the story of the flood about the new creation? It was this attempt, right, to, to have a, a foretaste of, of what God is going to do, that he had this new Adam and this new earth and, or this new, new, new Eden that was floating on the waters. And, and uh, what we have, though, in, in the story of the flood was, was just a foretaste of what God was going to do in Jesus Christ, that God was going to, not to wipe away humanity through a flood again, but rather that God was going to bring a new creation for us. A, a new life for us. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 talks about this new creation we have. It's not, that's not a verse about going to heaven when we die. This is about the new kind of life that we can find even today. That's what it said. The new is here. The old is gone. It's a, it's a thing that we have today. And as we think about the Christian life, we start to realize that what we're aiming for in the Christian life is not just to be you know, better versions of ourselves or more well-adjusted or maybe just a little bit more moral. But what the Christian life really is, is an invitation to getting off the rut, to stopping the patterns of destruction and, dis and, and, and uh, dysfunction that we find ourselves in. It's an invitation to a new kind of life altogether that's marked by the kingdom of God, not by the same patterns we see with Noah and we see with every other human life. It's a new kind of life that we are offered in Christ. And this life of freedom, this life of deliverance, this life of forgiveness, this life of, of new creation, it begins when we begin to trust in Christ and then it just grows from there. So as we think of this biblical message of the new creation, we see the pattern from Genesis. It's the pattern that every single one of us has experienced. But the invitation through Christ is that God has dealt with the root problem, our hearts. And he's offered us a new life in Christ a life that is the invitation for every single one of us. Let's pray. And so Father, uh, we, we hear the story of Noah and honestly, this is our story, that we are the kinds of people who find ourselves stuck. There are patterns of destruction, there's patterns of selfishness, there's patterns of, of, of dysfunction that we just keep living into. We see it every single day in our lives. And Father, we, we yearn for something more than this, this, this invitation that you have to new creation, an invitation to step out of the patterns of anxiety, of anger, of bad marriages, of, of, of bitterness and unforgiveness and addictions in order to find something new and free in you. And so we know this begins with the step of faith that when we declare that Jesus is our Lord, that he's our savior, that he is the path that we're gonna follow. And so Lord Jesus, today, we just say a simple prayer for those who have never prayed this before. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me my sin? Would you lead my life? This is the step towards the new creation. But from there, Lord, I pray that you might, you might broaden our minds and our hearts to what it is that you can do in us through Jesus Christ. That, that we might aim for something that's just, it's more than just morality, it's more than just uh, having hope that we get to go to heaven when we die, but it's this new creation that we can begin to experience even today. The old is gone, the new is here. May we begin to experience the power of your kingdom at work in us as we begin to experience the new life in Christ. Lord, we thank you, we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray today, amen. 
Friends, thanks so much for worshiping with us today. If you found that this, this worship service spoke to you, we'd encourage you to take a moment to share. You can like it, you can share it through lots of different social media. Just take a moment, share it with those around you. A big thank you to those who helped produce this worship time, to Pastor Spencer for sharing that word out of, out of the book of Genesis, to the worship team, to Alec and those behind the scenes in production. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you once again next week as we finish up on why the world is the way that it is. And then there's something new coming up as we head into Lent. You'll want to be here with us. So glad you joined us today. The Lord bless you. Oh